You're unmuted now. Your screen. Welcome back, Kirk. How are you doing? Good. Glad you have a mic. I do. You sound I, clear. Uh, Sounds good. I'm traveling to uh, Arizona for spring break, or excuse me, spring training, which of canceled. course got canceled. Oh, okay. I'm uh, flying back tonight a little bit early. All right. So uh, you're a... not uh, practicing social distancing yet, huh? <laughs> we are. We haven't you're done anything forced. fun, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, you're being forced to practice it because you would have been out there watching the Cubs or something today. So right. uh, yeah. so go ahead, take it away. I know you brought some things to the table. Before you get going, though, Kirk, <clears throat> the whole team appreciates the nice things you wrote about us in that um, Seeking the Alpha article. Yeah, well, hopefully, uh, hopefully a couple people are uh, joining us today. Uh, can you see the screen where I have the yeah. uh, Twitter feed? Got it. Yeah. So back on uh, January 22nd, I tweeted this, uh, that coronavirus would probably be, you know, the most important story going. And this was pretty ahead of time. I've been following the whole disease X research probably for 15 years now. So when I saw this, I knew it'd be a pretty big deal. In some of the articles I wrote and webinars I gave, I told folks to probably get the 75% cash. And so a lot of my subscribers were, are super heavy cash and they're not traders uh, for the most part. So they're not shorting or anything. They're just waiting for their opportunity. And I think that you're going to get a pretty big opportunity uh, with what you guys were just talking about with just a handful, a handful of oil stocks um, but really oil more than anything. I think oil uh, is going to be a heck of a buy. Um, I don't know you guys chart and chart and chart, so I'm not showing you anything new. But a look, at, look at how amazing that price around $77 a barrel is. You know, they, we, we broke through it. Mm -hmm. It was support for a long time, yeah. and now it's resistance. And now we're way down at what, $29, $28 a barrel? Yes, almost at the 16 lows. So you have this other level at about 42, is it? 40, 41, 42, right in here. Yeah, that was where, a January low, 42 about. Yeah, and, and, that had, and that had acted as support for a long time, right? So now yeah, it's yeah. going to be resistance. And I think the big question is when do we break through it? Uh, because certainly once a whole bunch of companies, and you guys don't need this chart because I know that you guys are way ahead of me on that. But when a bunch of these companies go bankrupt, you know, then, then what happens to oil supply? Does Saudi Arabia drill baby drill forever? I think the answer is yes. You know, they have the cheapest oil on the world. Why wouldn't they pump it? Um, I know we mentioned this last time I was on, but when I was at the Consumer Electronics Show, uh, it, it's clear that electric vehicles are going to hit really hard in the middle of the decade uh, because of some legal things with uh, mileage requirements. Uh, executives from every company that I heard from said by 2026, it'll be easier to buy an EV than it will be to buy uh, an ICE vehicle, an internal combustion engine vehicle. So all the small sedans with you know, exception of some sports car and whatnot, um, some specialty cars, but, but all the mass market sedans and crossovers are all going to be EV by 25, 26. So what you're going to see is another huge um, demand destruction event. And, you know, right now with coronavirus, that's, you know, unexpected, uh, but, we should be looking to the middle of the decade for the beginning of the end of, of oil demand growth. And in fact, I'm writing an article right now that I'm not so sure that we're going to see oil demand growth at all after maybe next year or the year after. And the reason for that is the changes to the economy from coronavirus, a lot of those changes are going to be permanent. There are people throughout 
corporations all over the planet now who the management would usually keep people coming to the office to work. Well, upper management, the executive level management is going to change that. So the middle management isn't going to be able to tell people, hey, come into the office because it's what I like anymore. There's going to be people working remotely um, forever. Everywhere, yeah. Yeah, and it was a change that was gradually coming, and this is something that's going to push us forward five or ten years. And think about what that does to oil demand. If the Morning commute. Yeah, what if 10 or 20 percent more people – work from home. Like we've been doing for 20 years. Right. And, and I moved my office home uh, five years ago now. And you know, Kirk, uh, I, I didn't know that you had done a lot of, it's the first time I heard you use the terminology um, disease X. Is that the term? Yeah. Disease X is after SARS, um, the World Health Organization and other health organizations became very concerned that there could be a disease that would kill 10 to 30 percent of the people who got it and spread like a cold and or, or the flu. So this disease uh, that we're seeing right now has they've been looking for it and the thing that's going to this is basically a dry run I guess um, this spreads like the flu. So it wouldn't be unusual for a third of the people on the planet to get this. Um, but we're lucky that it only kills one or 2% of the people who get it. So, and, and generally people with compromised immune systems or who are, are older. Uh, I think, I think Kirk, that the actual number uh, is much smaller than one to 2%. Um, and, and we can't be sure about it because, as you know, many people are asymptomatic or right. almost asymptomatic, so they never get diagnosed. Correct. So I, I, I'm, I'm not saying that to say that it's a disease we shouldn't take you know, seriously or whatever. Obviously, we have to be very, very careful. I mean, for example, me and my family, we've taken precautions since two weeks ago, but I'm just saying that thankfully, I think that the actual percentage is smaller than that. But I think you're probably can't right. Know because we don't know the exact number in the denominator, you know what I mean? Yeah, we never right. will. Absolutely. Yeah, and we never will. Absolutely. And so, one right. more thing since I interrupted you. I want to, whenever you get to it, I want to know what you think they're going to do with the U.S. sale industry. Do you think they're going to bail them out? What do you think is going to happen? Because that's going to be huge for the U.S. Go to which it now. Industry? The shale. Shale oh, shale. Um, I don't think they're going to bail out shale. There's so, your answer. Yeah. Okay, I, so I, how I, do you think this is going to play out? So, in short, I think you're going to see about half of the shale industry go out of business. And there is plenty of money out there in private equity to buy the good assets. So there's no need for the government to come and step in. There's no reason for them to uh, bail out the companies. Now, the banks who are going to be on the hook for a lot of the debt, they're going to get a lifeline and you're already seeing that. So it's not going to be the, the shale companies that get, that get rescues. It's going to be the yeah, banks. A, like, that are oh, what shale. a surprise. Uh, do you think that's why they were at the White House? Not to just talk about, you know, our, our balance sheets are strong and we're going to help people, but they went there because they knew they were going to take some hits on this paper. Oh, for sure. And, and I think that we've known that for a little while now. Yeah. Before so, Corona became news, they were, right. this was happening. Right. So, you know, I was writing my, uh, my plan for the year. I mean, euphoria to despair. I mean, back before Christmas, I told people, you know, look for the market to peak in January and then start selling I remember that. And, and it's because the valuations across the board were high, right? So you can use any screener you want. And you should have been able to tell that valuations were very high. Or, you know, you go over to Advisor Perspectives with D. Short and Jill Malinsky, and they keep track of it for you. You know, this is the third most overvalued stock market in history. And there was no 
reason without more GDP growth and more revenue growth to expect that to last. Um, I was of the belief that the tax cuts were wearing off. The Fed is basically pushing on a string. Um, you know, and, and they're going to be able to bail out who they need to bail out, but they're not going to create GDP growth. So this shock to the system isn't, it's not as if we're going to get a V-shaped recovery and everybody's going to make the money back. The money that's lost this quarter and next quarter is, is pretty much permanent loss. It's not, you know, it's not something that just snaps back. So, you know, if you're running Disneyland, you're never going to get that, that, that month back. You know, and if you're running, you know, a theater group or a restaurant group or an airline, you know, half of the airlines are going to go bankrupt. So this is not money that comes back. This is a hole and we're going to have to fill it in as best we can so that we just so we can climb out. And, and I think we're I think a recession started last week. Uh, I don't think there's much you know, doubt to that. Um, you know, the definition of recession isn't back-to-back -back quarters of negative growth. The definition of, of recession really is just an economic slowdown. Clearly, we've gotten that. So as far as the oil companies go, I heard you guys talking about a generational opportunity to buy certain oil companies. I'm not positive there's going to be many to choose from. You know, on this list, these companies already had horrible current and quick ratios. If you take a look at their, um, their debt and, 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 and revenues, you look at it and you go, how do these companies stay in business? And the answer was on borrowed money. So where are these companies going to be able to borrow money in the future? And I think the answer is almost nowhere. So companies that uh, cut a deal with private equity uh, you know, they'll sell 40% of a company to private equity. And you take a look at, you know, Diamondback e Energy, everybody likes, but their finances are bad. Um, why are they paying a dividend yield if they don't have good finances? You know, so will they declare bankruptcy and go through a reorganization? Maybe. Um, will private equity come in there and, and buy part of the company, maybe even a majority of the company? Maybe. But what we know is that these companies, their stock prices are just going to go further and further down. Um, I wish, you know, I had talked about Saudi Arabia turning to a drill baby drill program in the past. I'm surprised that it happened the way that it happened. But if you take a look at it from the, the standpoint of the Saudi Arabians and the Russians, why wouldn't they kill shale during a demand shock? You know, it makes sense for them to kill shale once or for all. Um, and next year, you know, you can, you can believe what you want to believe, but I've been saying this for six months now. There's going to be a Democrat president. I think after tomorrow it will be obvious that it's Joe Biden. Um, and that's going to change a lot of policy. So, okay, I want to come back to disease X, okay? okay. So everyone is just assuming <clears throat> there's going to be an election. So we're going to see some problems like during the primaries. Uh, there's such a conflict and uh, you, you did studies about disease X. So is right. it like it was in the pandemic of 1918 where um, disease X will make its first appearance, which is happening globally right now. And then in 1918, uh, Everyone thought the Spanish flu was over. They went out on Armistice Day and celebrated. The war is over. The flu is over. And it came back with a vengeance for the second wave. And that was uh, the more deadly of the two. Uh, do you think that um, maybe we peak, this virus peaks for a while in May and everyone thinks things are okay and it's now part of uh, just the biology uh, on earth now and that it reemerges again in the fall and if it does what guarantee is there that there even is an election um knowing that this is more than the presidency for uh president trump this is uh, probably his freedom because if he loses a presidency um there can be a lot of people going after him 
I know there's a lot in that question, wow. but what do you what do you think? <laughs> All right, so let's let's stick with uh, epidemiology. The reemergence. Okay. <laughs> Let, let's start with the disease. So this is not disease X. It's not serious enough. It's not. And and like so so you identify you know the death rate right now is 3.4 percent. However, that's mainly in China. As the disease spread, it became weaker because everybody's immune systems um, beat it down and it just wasn't as serious in the, the next, every time the wave goes further out, it's less serious. So we probably will see, if you segregate out China, the death rate probably is below 1%, right? You know, we've seen 0.6 and 0.7 in, in a number of countries and I think that's probably the reality. This is so. Not you think it? You think it? Uh, next time it comes around, it doesn't have as much impact as it does this time, and this time's not bad. That's what the way it sounds to me. Not that bad. So I don't want to be light on this, but this is really a super flu, right? This is a super flu. Disease X would kill a double digit percentage of the people that got it. And that's what they've been looking for since I SARS. See. Okay. Uh, and we do know to focus on coronavirus because there's many, many strains of it. So we do know to look for vaccines and solutions for this. But what if there's something else? And that's what we're worried about. So I think that the social distancing becomes, you know, uh, a little bit more permanent, you know, more washing hands, more sanitizers. There's going to be a more of a focus on killing pathogens on surfaces and hoping that nothing emerges in an aerosol form. So I don't worry too much about this one. Um, what the head guy at the White House said is that they want to shut everything down for eight weeks if there's more than 50 people. And I know that President Trump doesn't like that idea, but it's the right thing to do. Because we know that the pathogen, you can be a carrier for about a month. You know, originally they thought 14 days, but it's about a month now. Yes. Also, you can get this twice. So there are people in Italy who are getting this for the second time already. And the second time, it's incredibly weak. So there's something about our bodies that are learning how to fight this. And especially as it comes in... In, 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 in strains that are less virulent. However, at some point it mutates and it turns into something different. It won't happen that fast, it never does. It takes years and years and years for it to mutate into something that is more dangerous. So five, 10, 15 years out, that's what we have to be concerned with is this disease won't go away just like no other disease goes away, but like the flu, it'll change a little bit. And at some point, one of those changes will be more deadly. And that's, and that's what we have to keep an eye on. Um, if you take a look at Hong Kong after SARS, they changed the way that they live. And Hong Kong hasn't been that affected by this because they already were practicing kind of regular social distancing, you know, respect everybody's three foot rule, um, you wipe things down nonstop. You know, they, they've always worn the latex gloves, or not always, but <clears throat> excuse me, in the last 15 years, the latex gloves and the uh, face masks. So I don't want to make it sound like we're all going to walk around with masks for the rest of eternity, but I think that we're going to be more careful um, and that this isn't the thing that that we need to worry about. It's the next thing or the thing after that or the thing after that. As far as Trump goes, um, all I will say is that when Camilla Harris is attorney general, he probably ought to make sure he keeps his legal team intact. That's what I mean. <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah, but you can't, he, there's not going to be a way for him to stay in office unless okay. he wins the vote. All right. Well, Bill Maher and I are the only two guys worried about that. All right. So um, anyway, so how do we invest around this now uh, besides looking for an opportune time to uh, just buy the underlying commodity crude? Uh, what I, are you doing? I think that you're doing the right thing, shorting it down somewhere into the 20s. Maybe it has a hot minute where it's in the teens. Um, 
but I wouldn't be too excited about oil getting over 42 barrels, you know, $42 a barrel, uh, except under one situation. I think the only circumstance, the only scenario that I've seen uh, that makes sense to me for oil to rebound because the glut is so big at this point um, is if there's a war in the Middle East. The only way you see the price of oil really jump is if they start shooting missiles between Iran and Saudi Arabia. As you know, I thought that the simmering would have boiled over by now. Um, with this much pressure on Saudi Arabia and everybody in OPEC, Iran in particular, Iran's very desperate right now. With this much financial and economic pressure on them, it wouldn't surprise me now that the Trump era of cooperation with Saudi Arabia is coming to an end. It wouldn't surprise me to see, you know, some sort of conflict emerge before the election. You know, if you want to get into conspiracy theories, we know that there's been presidents who, you know, make sure that there's some sort of a battle or, or, or mini war, some sort of war going on when elections come up because the old American thing of not changing a horse in midstream. So, you know, you can play that. I'm looking for oil to rise back up to 40-ish. And then after that, unless there's a conflict, I don't know if we break through that 42 level for quite a long time because if demand doesn't come back as fast as everybody thinks and private equity comes and gets half of the shale industry out of the bankruptcies and Saudi Arabia is drill, drill baby drill, you know, what if oil demand growth is done? What, what if we see, you know, flattish oil demand for the next seven or eight years and then it starts to fall? You know, my original projection had been for oil demand to fall by 2030. I don't know if that's right anymore. I think it might be 2026, 20, 2027. Um, you know, the arguments about emerging markets are just ringing hollow. Uh, this idea that there's, you know, more population, therefore more oil it's just not playing out that way. You know, we've had flattish oil demand for several years now. And I just think that that curve is going to keep turning over and coronavirus is going to push on it. I know that Saudi Arabia would love to have the price of oil up around 70. Uh, I just don't know how they're going to get it there without blowing something up. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you talked about that you would also have some ideas about investing around this coronavirus. Could it be uh, biotech that you're looking at, Kirk? Well, honestly, uh, I, oh, no. yeah. I, after many, many years of not being a gold bug. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I, I'm suddenly a gold bug. Yeah. I think that the, I think, I think that, Helicopter money is inevitable, right? I, I've just figured that they're going to print money to bail out the retirement system at some point. And I think it's a pretty easy call to see gold going up towards $3,000 an ounce. I'm not one of those $50,000 an ounce guys. I think that, you know, that starts to get silly. Um, but I do is think- Is today a good price to enter, do you think? I don't even know what it is right now. What is it, 1700 Gold? Yeah. 14, $1,460. Oh, it dropped We're all down, way down $240 in a week. Yeah, I, I, I suppose I'd be looking at it. I mean, I don't know. And the, go, and the shares, are. if you're looking at shares, um, gold stocks, um, they were obliterated. Yeah, so I'm buying GDX probably today. So okay. I think Newmont Mining is the best gold company on the planet. Um, I've done very deep research on them. Uh, their consolidation, their cleaning up of the balance sheet, their merger with um, uh, Gold Corp, um, I think is uh, probably leaves them with an awful lot of upside. Uh, I have charted them out. I think that they go over $100 a share in the next year or two. But I think that the snapback rally, you have to remember, and I'm sure you guys know this, the oil, uh, excuse me, the gold stocks and gold got beat up because that was one of the only things that were up when people started getting margin calls. Well, you know, really, if you look at, uh, you know, from 2011, the gold shares never recovered the way the bullion recovered. 
Correct. Okay. So, uh, you know, just like you have problems with balance sheets in oil companies, I believe there are a lot of these miners that, um, you know, now we're back below production costs and silver and right. gold uh, that you really have to know balance sheets in mining companies too, don't you, Kirk? Yeah. So if you go back and just keep going back and you take a look at the GDX chart, okay. right? Because the production, depending on the mine, you're looking at between $900 and $1,100 an ounce for production. Um yeah. If you go, just go, just go way, way back to the last oil. Or excuse that was me, a high up there. Peak. That's when gold was 1900 right there. Yeah. Okay. And so why does it make any sense with a consolidated industry that's been cleaning up their balance sheets all during this period here, right? That I'm circling now. This is when they were consolidating and cleaning up balance sheets. This fall off right here is a gift. Now, can it go a little bit lower for sure? You know, stock prices can always go a little bit lower. But to be able to get GDX under 20 right now, it doesn't make any sense. So if you just want, you know, if you're comfortable making 50% in a year, I think you made 50% just owning GDX. You know, so I will say I was just down in Puerto Rico and I was, you know, because I'm checking out the tax code and the climate and the quality of life down there because I'm kicking around moving. Um, and I was hanging out with a bunch of hedge fund guys and day traders. And I asked them, I said, What's, how much can you legitimately make trading 10 pips, 20 pips, 50 pips a day? And they told me. So I know that when I tell people about making 15, 20, 25% a year, which is what I do as a position trader, I kind of get a smirk. So, but with GDX, I think this goes from 20 to 30 you could do that in your sleep if you wanted to catch up on your fishing or golfing because nobody else is going to be doing it for a while. So what was your conclusion on Puerto Rico as far as re, uh, it being a good place to relocate to? It depends on your income and what your goals are. But I think that Puerto Rico is going to continue to get better. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity to invest and the tax code is ridiculously in your favor. So for me, uh, you, you still have to pay Social Security and Medicare tax. Um, but for me, I would essentially be getting out of the federal income tax in its entirety. So, you know, state of Wisconsin, I pay 6 7%. In, in Puerto Rico, I pay 4 And then there's no federal income tax. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're making six figures, um, there's an awful lot of reason to go down there if you like it. Um, and then I think that there is an awful lot of opportunity to invest there um, because the idea that it's just some destroyed um, earthquake, hurricane, destroyed island that's going to keep getting destroyed, I think is probably wrong. I mean, I don't know that you want to build 10 feet from the beach anymore, um, but I think there's a lot of opportunity. The, the only buildings that have really been destroyed down there are old buildings. Anything that's newer is fine. So, I mean, that, that's what people have to realize is that the newer construction is held up just fine. Uh, but it's, you know, they had a lot of 100, 200, 300-year-old buildings. That well, there's also issues with uh, the power grid still. And uh, how about internet for being a trader? These guys didn't have any interruptions? Right. You have to be traders. You have to be on one of the major uh, telco lines and have the line run right into your house. So you may have to pay a couple hundred dollars to do that. Okay. Uh, and as far as the energy goes, they have the fifth largest uh, solar and energy storage project in the world going right on right now. So I think in the next year or two, you're probably going to see that country just fine on communications and energy. The water is fine. Uh, what they don't have, which is weird to me, and I being in the Midwest and understanding farming, they're very bad at food security. And I tell you what, you drop something, you drop a seed on the ground, and it's going to grow. So I don't know why they're bad at energy. Uh, excuse me, uh, uh, food security there, because um, they in, import like seventy percent of their food. Well, Kirk, you know, I'm just going to interrupt you, not not because time is up, but you could buy GDX at sixteen. 65 right here yeah i'm looking at that right now okay and so. i think i'm going to so uh all right 
I think that's the plan. I, I think that gold is an easy one here. They're going to, they're going, you're going to see, take a look at the money charts, the money supply chart going all the way back to the great depression. Yeah. You're going to see a massive leg up in money supply here in the next couple of years. Okay. All right. I mean, well, that, uh, okay. By definition, that's inflation, right? Yeah. So uh, the best place for people to follow you, buddy, is still on Twitter at Kirk Spano. Yeah. Or if you, you want, want to give them there, uh, and, and, your and blog. You can always find me over here at Seeking Alpha. I put a lot of my free stuff out there. Um, and then if, if you really want, you can go to my website, which is uh, Fundamental Trends. And what I've done is I've set up a free library card. Oh. So you can sign up there and get maybe 70% of what I'm doing. So I, I release it pretty quick. Okay. So just and what if you're late card. bringing your uh, PDF back to your library? Pardon? A fun, you know, uh, if, what if you're late returning uh, oh. your PDF to the library? You get fined? No, I lock you in a room and you day trade for me. <laughs> <laughs> I get 50%. <laughs> anyway, uh, any hot librarians in there? Uh, oh, her. <laughs> That's what I have around the website, man. <laughs> I'll tell you what, bro. Uh, you know, it, it's it's been great having you back. And, uh, yeah, I wish you a lot of good fortune on your transition to becoming a, an energy trader, the pure thing, and uh, spend some time in our chat room with traders. There are a lot of crew traders in there, Kirk. And, uh, you know, kind I, of, I, I just, I just lurk. I've been lurking and watching. You're lurking. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, thanks for being with us. Uh, I hope uh, you're right. Um, uh, do you think we'll have a lockdown here in the U S for a few weeks? Yes. I, I think that, uh, there's going to probably be an executive action that says, Hey, close everything for a month. Okay, everything for a month. Do you have enough food at home? Yeah, I actually went to Costco before I came out on this trip, and yeah. I bought everything I needed except toilet paper. Oh, boy. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, I got my daughter tracking some down. Okay. Otherwise, you can use the newspaper. So, uh, everyone, uh, <laughs> Kirk Spano. Yeah. Uh, you could uh, follow him on Twitter at Kirk Spano. He's a great writer, a great researcher, and um, I have a pretty good feeling he's going to be a very good trader as well. So uh, anything he puts his mind to. Thanks for hanging out with us today, Kirk, and uh, I hope that uh, this spring that's coming up, uh, we're all renewed and uh, refreshed with some nice trading to uh, come into our account. Okay. okay. You take care, Dale. All right, my trading warrior brother, Kirk Spano, everybody. Looking for an important crude bottom and believes that gold shares are a gift down here. Write it down and we could congratulate him or interrogate him next time he's on. Okay. So thanks, Kirk, everybody. See everyone for Turnaround Tuesday. Don't just count your pips, count your blessings. And I think a lot of people are doing that a little bit more often now that they, you know, feel like their lives have changed. And we'll see everyone tomorrow for Turnaround Tuesday. Adios. Thanks, Kurt. Take care. You're welcome, Sinatra, Monica, Sean, Forex, Gal. Thanks for hanging out with us. See you tomorrow.